What's going on, guys? Welcome back to TGW number 96. I am joined once again by Tech Deals. We had a week off last week, and then the week before that, you had the week off. Well, we, yes. Yeah, yes, we ended up ended up miss, ended up uh, missing Tech Deals in the previous week, unfortunately, but we got him back for this week, so hopefully we'll be back on the ball with that and everything. But how was your uh, how was your past two weeks? You've been busy. Very busy. Um, besides enjoying the nicer weather down here in Texas, been playing with the kids and. Uh, testing some new hardware and uh, working on two builds at the moment, which I really should have only started one, but they kind of went together. So I've got two in progress, but other than that, just doing videos. Yeah, I started to slowly get back into the content after the move and everything and started working on stuff. And I was I went to go start testing Ryzen 1400 the other day, which was a really fun chip, actually. I was surprised with just how good it was for the price it is. Um, but I started off by putting it in my X370 build with the Gigabyte motherboard. And I was like, all right, I'm going to overclock in this thing. Put it up to uh, 3.8 gigahertz, which I had heard a lot of reviewers were hitting on goods on good chips. And uh, it immediately just black screened and I couldn't get back into the BIOS or Windows. And I tried everything, man. I tried, I pulled the battery. I held the clear CMOS button. I switched to the alternate BIOS on the motherboard. Nothing worked. This motherboard is completely bricked now on the Gigabyte X370 board. Really? So, yep. Kind of an unfortunate set of events. But that led to me just taking it and throwing it in my B350 Tomahawk, which now after a couple of BIOS versions is actually pretty stable with the Corsair RAM anyway. Interesting. Um, was your Gigabyte board, um, did it have the latest updated BIOS to support Ryzen 5 in it? It did, yes. I had actually just updated it. That, like, mm. like an hour prior, I had updated the BIOS, and I had got back into, um, you know, Windows and everything, absolutely fine, on the latest BIOS and all that, so everything was running good for about an hour. And I was like, all right, I got all my games downloaded and everything, I want to start testing, so let's go see what kind of overclock I can get out of this thing. And the first overclock I set just bricked the motherboard. I can't, Were you uh, can't, using the stealth cooler or an aftermarket? It was an aftermarket water cooler. 3.8 shouldn't be a challenge for a water cooler. That's no. uh, you, you leave the voltages on default for that. I put it on. I put it on uh, 1.35 volts at 3.8 gigahertz. I've That's, had a lot of. I've had a lot of success with 1.35 on. And uh, Reese on Ryzen mother on Ryzen CPU, so that's why I decided to try that, which ended yeah, up, and which ended up being my stable overclock anyway. But it was three point seven instead of three point eight. I got it stable on the B three fifty at three point seven one point three five. Interesting. Yeah, so I, I'm not really too sure about that. I like I said, yeah, I tried uh, switching it to the other BIOS and on the motherboard and everything, and still just will not boot on that thing. I I pulled out, I ch swapped out the CPU. I was like, all right, I'll throw my 1800X back in there that I know works. And that wouldn't work either. <laughs> so just basically a bricked motherboard, which is unfortunate because it's in a beautiful system. And it's and and even though Gigabyte will, will replace it, it's a pain to rip that out. Yeah, it's that's that's that that's the big headache of it, is it's a complete custom system with, you know, I spent tons of hours like not tons of hours. I spent probably an hour or two. Cable managing it, <laughs> tons of hours, an hour or two. Let's just be honest. And and painstakingly took care of it. Right now, all of <laughs> all of our viewers are playing you the world's smallest violin. Like, oh, poor Joker. Him and, yes. his, him and his free case and his free motherboard, and, and it broke. Uh, oh, well. Well, you know, the funny thing about that is... Um, it's the, the amount of time it takes, and I, I think a lot of people who watch tech reviewers, now there's all kinds of tech reviewers, but I'll say that good ones such as yourself do a lot more than just throw a part in, do one setting and say, hey, look, I built a machine and here's a motherboard. There's hours of work behind the scenes. Um, a good video takes a lot of work to put together. Yeah, it does. Yeah, so. a lot of time when you consider this, the the testing alone is rather tedious. And then getting your graphs together, filming everything, scripting everything. If you do that, uh, some people are saying again they're having issues with the video. This we had this problem a few weeks back, if you remember, streaming where some people were getting video and audio and other people weren't. It was dependent on if they were using like mobile or not. People that were using mobile for whatever reason, the live streams weren't working for them. 
but people on desktop PCs weren't having an issue. So, PC master race for the win. Get on a desktop computer. <laughs> that's, I think that's exactly what it boils down to. Um, but before we get into the topics, uh, you said you had something interesting for show and tell, right? You wanted to show people? I actually have two things for show and tell. I only told you about one of them. Oh, surprise. And the, the first one <laughs> is I have been testing this. Flare X Ryzen certified RAM, DDR4, 3200 megahertz RAM. I don't want to spoil anything. But if you want to run guaranteed DDR4 3200, this has run at 3200 in every board. Really, even B350? Uh, I don't have any B350s built yet, but three of my X370s, it runs at 3200 without complaint. Gotcha. Yeah, I was able to get my Guile thir um, kit working at 3200, but it was really finicky and did not work every time at all. Not all of my 3200 other kits work at 3200. Some do, some don't. Um, some will work in the MSI board and some will work in the ASUS board, but not vice versa. The only downside at the moment to the Flare X RAM versus, say, the Rip Jaws 5 or the Trident Z RAM is price. It costs more. But if you want to pay more to get a guarantee, knock yourself out. The, the deal, everybody take a drink now, um, the deal is still going to be like Rip Jaws 5 memory for $120 for DDR4-3200. And if it doesn't run at 3200 and only runs at 2666 or 2933, I mean, that's still, you know, really good. But, you know, for about 100 and I think it's on sale for $170, $176 on Newegg right now, that Flarex RAM. I mean, I've only put it in three motherboards, but so far it works perfectly. Did you say 176? I think it's 175 or 176 on Newegg. I, yeah, that's pretty. It was expensive. yesterday that I looked at it. Yeah, that's pretty expensive. This um, this Corsair kit I've got right here, 16 gigabytes at 3,000, is 125, and this has been my favorite RAM to go with so far on Ryzen. That's they originally shipped this with the reviewer kits, and it worked day one for me at 2933. And I've got another kit of it here. These are the white dims that Corsair just sent out. I'm going to be using this in a build that's my show and tells basically this RAM and SSD they sent over. I'm going to be doing kind of a budget Ryzen build with, I haven't decided which CPU yet. I, I was leaning towards the 1400, but a lot of people made a good case for the 1600 yesterday in the comments on my video. Between those two, where do you tend to lead? Do you think the 1600 is worth the extra money if you're really just going after gaming? Absolutely. 100% no doubt. The, the 1400, I've got a 1400 build in progress only because everybody expects to see one, but I'm going to beat the hammer 16 ways from Sunday in that video and say, look, take this wonderful build, <laughs> spend a little bit more money and get more clock speed and 50% more cores. Two years from now, you'll be really glad you did. The, I just don't, look, uh, Ghost Recon Wildlands, uh, Assassin's Creed Syndicate, The Division, okay, those are all Ubisoft titles. Battlefield 1, Mass Effect Andromeda, all those games will use more than four threads today. I realize that when the AMD FX chips came out six, five, six years ago, and or five years ago, and the pitch was, you need eight cores because we're going to have, you know, multi-threaded games any day now. Okay, any day now took five years, but... It's not any day now. Now it's today. And so it finally arrived. And I think that going forward, the roughly $50, what is it? Actually, it is. It's exactly $50 price difference between a 1400 and a 1600. And the 1400 has an out of the box speed of 3.4. And the 1600 has an out of the box speed of, uh, tw of what, 3.6? For the 1600? Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, there's so many numbers to remember. <laughs> it is. Yeah, it's it's hard. Yeah, this this is 3.2 on the 1400. I remember that because I just tested it yesterday. <laughs> well, so I remember thing, that one. So, so, so you're getting a higher guaranteed base speed out of the box, plus you're getting a larger cooler. Keep in mind that you're getting a Wraith Spire versus a Wraith Stealth. You're getting 50% more cores. I mean, if you're building a whole computer, once you spend the money on a case, motherboard, RAM, power supply, graphics card, 50 bucks? Ah, not everybody has the money, and I respect that, but if you've got 50 bucks. 
I think it also comes down to if you have just 50 bucks left, you choose to spend that 50 bucks on the CPU or on the GPU. If it's a difference between getting like an RX 570 versus a 580. Because I think that is, that's, I think it come down to that for a lot of people. You can buy the R5 1600 and I think you can keep it for five years. You'll upgrade your graphics card at least once, if not twice in those five years. It's relatively cheap. I mean, graphics cards are relatively easy to take out, sell, buy another one. CPUs, generally, you want to keep longer. I would put the money in the CPU first. Um, but, you know, everybody has their... Per it also depends on how much you upgrade. If, if you're the kind of person who goes, man, I, I just build a new computer every two years, and I give my my old computer to my little brother or I give it to my parents. And so I just build a new computer every two years. Eh, okay, then it probably doesn't matter so much. I just find the fact that $220 for a 1600 plus $80 for a B350 motherboard, that's an un uh, 300 bucks for essentially Broadwell E performance? That's crazy. And that's cooler motherboard and CPU. Yeah. I can't sing the praises enough. Yeah, I, I need to definitely get the uh, 1600 in there and test it and really look at the numbers closer and do, you know, apples to apples comparison between the two before I could definitely make the final call for myself. But what you're saying definitely makes sense. I mean, it isn't for everybody, but I mean, let's be honest here. You know, if you just want to play games... A six-year-old i5 2400 with a with a GTX 1050 will play most games reasonably well at 1080p. I mean, if you want to talk about budget, I know I know I've mentioned that multiple times, but I mean that, that's that's the budget deal. Yep. Yeah, you know, a couple of people are saying that the uh, the audio sync is off. That really just comes down to how I'm seeing Skype and how that is getting received into OBS. Because even just looking at Skype by itself talking to tech deals like it's out of sync for me listening to them so before it's even getting to obs it's out of sync so there's really not now to do on my end because it's out of sync for me too so it's really just uh it's a skype don't, issue you've been dealing with for like a month and a half now don't look at me just listen to me <laughs> it usually it, it actually does uh, kind of sort itself out as things go on but in the interest in interest in moving on you want to get into the uh the first topic here on ddr6 before we do that one more show and tell okay Any guesses what that is? That is an EVGA 1080 Ti ICX card or SCX or whatever they're calling them now. It's yeah, it's the ICX, uh, ICX. Super Clock Two. Yes. Um, nice heard... grill, backplate ventilated, which I don't know if it does anything or not. Yeah, I heard the build I... quality on them is insane. Yeah, they yeah, these new ICXs are way over engineered, and um, I think that the teardown that uh, Steve over at Gamers Nexus did was very detailed. And if anybody wants to see that ripped apart, because I'm not taking it apart, because I, I that was not sent to me by EBGA. I paid for that, so ouch. Um, I will say that I've been testing it, and it's fascinating at how quickly games catch up to graphics cards. Because you'd think a 1080 Ti would play everything at ultra max detail without any compromises. Not so much. I'll have a video on that soon. Nice. Yeah, I think of the 1080 Ti custom cards, that'd probably be the one that I would want to go for. Or I do, I do have one other fancier card that's more expensive with a larger heat sink and fan. Mm -hmm. It's quieter, it's not any faster. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go above that if all you care about is performance. But yeah, I think it mostly just comes down to which brand you want to get, which one you like, because I'm willing to bet that I could take my 1080 Ti and overclock it to the max and probably tie you on that card or get pretty darn close to it within the margin of error, probably. What do you have, a Founders? Yeah, Founders card. Oh, uh, yes, absolutely. If if you don't care about the fan speed noise, your Founder will run every bit as fast as that. The only difference is to be a little bit louder. Yep, <laughs> a lot, probably a lot bit louder, let's be honest. It's it's quite a, it's It's rather loud. It, is, it does get into leaf blower mode, especially in an air-cooled case like I have right now. But hopefully I'll uh, address that soon. I'm hopefully get one of those new fractal coolers, which we're going to be talking about in a bit. But uh, let's see, DDR6 got unveiled uh, recently. They had shown it off a few weeks ago, but today they had actual wafers at GTC, so kind of reaffirming everything that was in the previous rumors that it was going to be 
in NVIDIA Volta, although the GPU they showed off today, the Volta um, V100, is actually running on HBM2. But I think we're looking at seeing DDR6 in more of the, the consumer Volta GPUs, which we probably won't get until sometime next year. But it's certainly shaping up to be insanely fast. And if, double, du yeah, double the performance of uh, GDDR5. Yeah, and if and if the you know history holds true, they'll probably get better yields out of this than what you would see with HBM2, which is probably why they're going looking to go that route instead. Notice that AMD's Fury and Fury X just kind of disappeared without a real replacement. I think that HBM turned out to be harder to make in mass than they thought it would be. Yeah, I think yeah, they were having issues with the HBM yields from the very beginning, and that's just kind of extended into HBM2 because it, it only really felt like they thought they were going to have an HBM2 GP ready for around the time that like the 1080 and 1070 came out, but they just didn't have that. So they chose to go really aggressive with the marketing. And we're going after the budget market. Well, it's probably because that's all you have anything ready for. Well, let's be honest. We heard the name Vega from AMD a year ago. Yep. Vega is already, and I, and we're going to talk about Vega in a minute, so I won't get into it. But uh, Vega, Vega is already horribly delayed, and it's just shame because Ryzen is so great, and here they are kind of suffering on the GPU end. But um, regarding HBM2, I suspect that making HBM2, you mentioned the Tesla uh, V100 that was announced today, and I, and I did read the article bef before we got on. Um, it's impressive. I mean, uh, over 20 billion transistors. The thing is huge. It's on a new production process from Samsung. It's amazing. But I'll bet you that chip actually costs a lot, a lot of money to make. But if you're selling the cards for three or six thousand dollars a piece, who cares, right? Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. But either. we're not going to see HBM2 on on 500R consumer cards. I think in the next year, we may never see it. I mean, if they keep improving GDDR memory. They're gonna just they're gonna blow right past HBM2 while AMD is sitting there waiting to still get it on one of their graphics cards for consumers, and I think yeah. we probably will see it on Vega. But this kind of all our first three topics here kind of all tie in together with the announcement of Tesla, the reveal of the DDR6, and then also talking about the limitations of HBM, which very well may, very well may be why they're going to have limited cards at release if the rumors hold true. This was a rumor that was originally perpetuated over by Anthony over at Tweaktown, who said he had a source that said there was only there was going to be less than sixteen thousand AMD Vega cards at launch, pointing directly at HBM2 as the reasoning for that. So that kind of all ties in what we're talking about here with why Nvidia is kind of hedging their bets on DDR6 moving forward for the cons at least the consumer side of GPUs. There, there still might be like Titan X variants with HBM2, but they usually sell a lot less of those than like the 1070 or what would be the 2070, I guess, on these new graphics cards when those are available. Well, first up, I don't remotely believe the 16,000 card number. <clears throat> and the reason why, I mean, look, it, it could be true. I have no inside information whatsoever. Uh, in fact, just yesterday, I emailed AMD again and said, hey, Vega, Soon, maybe. Can you tell me anything? <laughs> I did the same you know, thing recently. <laughs> that basically, their response is no comment. We're not ready to discuss it. So, um, and that's fine. So, I have no information. Here's what I'll say about 16,000 cards. Let's say that they have an ASP or an average selling price of $500 a card. 16,000 cards at $500 a card is $8 million. AMD doesn't get all of that. So, let's say they get half of it after the memory has to be purchased and the board vendor has to make money and the retailer has to make money, that's $4 million. AMD is a multi-billion dollar company. I, I, I have a hard time seeing them do a major product launch with potential first day sales of $4 million. It, it, AMD had a million Ryzen CPUs available at launch. 16,000, I don't know. That's seems, my mental math. It seems pretty low. I think that would be even less than what NVIDIA had around for the 1080 when that launched last year. Oh, yeah. I Look, it, the 16,000 number might be true for the reference cards or one vendor or maybe just the top-end model. Maybe they're going to launch three models, which I, I don't know if they're going to have three models. I mean, there's been rumors, but 
I just want to make clear to the viewers that I have no one. We have not gotten a press briefing from AMD, so we're just guessing. No, absolutely nothing. We know we know as much as you guys know out there. Well, and of course, when, once when we, we get a press even, briefing, even we'll if, stop talking about like, it. <laughs> I've I've even asked and like begged, like, hey, if there's an NDA that you need me to sign, consider it signed. Like, I'm not going to say nothing. I just I just want to know, so I'm in good position to cover these cards at launch. And they're just like, we have nothing to say. That's it. So we know nothing that is not out there right now on the internet. But um, so sixteen thousand might be the top end card or some deluxe model or 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 maybe it's the reference cards and the add in board vendors will have you know half a million available for sale or something. I mean, it just seems like an incredibly small number of cards. So I'm, you know, it's it's possible that it's both correct and wrong at the same time. Yeah, and I guess. Kind of bouncing back to what NVIDIA announced here with Volta is, I mean, I guess this is very, still a very exciting announcement, though, that they are putting this out there, even though this is not going to be good for consumers. It's going to be a few thousand dollars for these at least. But I think it's a nice thing to kind of look at and then kind of get an idea of where they might go with the consumer GPs based off of the specs that we're seeing here, 5,120 CUDA cores. I mean, the Tesla P100 is 30,584, and... What, what did they end up having on Titan X Pascal and 1080 Ti? Uh, roughly, yeah, something like that. Uh, 1080 Ti is pretty close to that. Yeah, pretty close to that. So it's usually the full fat GPUs are not that far off from what we see on the 100 ch uh, chips that they use in these, you know, workhorse GPUs like this one. So, yeah. Well, and it's important that this, this high-end stuff comes out because it gets scooped up by the people who need it, who... To them, this is a trivial expense, yeah. and it pays for the development. So the rest of us, a year later, get awesome stuff for cheap. You know, it's um, basically Disney. <laughs> and I'll bet you Disney will buy a thousand of these on day one. They probably already have an agreement. Yeah, they've yeah they've been partnered with Nvidia for a while. I remember one year when they did one of their reveals, they brought out one of those like server mount GPU systems that had, like twelve, I think it was Maxwell GPUs in there. Just ready for there to do uh, like Pixar animation and stuff. Sure. So yeah, this and, this and, definitely and to Disney to buying buying ten million dollars worth of these cards is is just I mean it's a lot of money, but you know at the end of the day, if they release a movie that makes a billion dollars, they pay the actors more. Yeah. So I was. Uh, I, but I, yeah, it's exciting because we will have consumer desktop graphics cards probably i don't know if we'll have them next year i mean i'm just you know my crystal ball is fuzzy but don't you think maybe within two years we'll see our first top end consumer card with 16 gigs of vram probably i would say that's a fair bet they're probably will, i th i think that's the way that it's going for the volta lineup where i think they'll have probably one or two really high-end SKUs like the titan x and then maybe a ti later on but I sure. think that Titan X will, whatever their tight, the first Titan X is, will probably have 16 gigabytes of HBM2. And I'm sure it'll be like twelve to $1,500 too. <laughs> so, it's you, called the Early Adopter top, top Dog Tax. Otherwise known as the Founders Edition. They found, it basically means that they found a new way to bend you over the barrel. That's, that, that's, exa that's what you found. Nothing else besides that. That's, that's all you found with this edition. <laughs> Well, I do think it's impressive that they've got 21 billion transistors with a die size of 815 millimeters squared, which is, I don't, I, you know, I'm not familiar enough with the, with like the 22 and 24 core Xenon chips. Has Intel ever made a chip over 800 millimeters squared? That is a massive chip. Yeah. And they've also brought it down to 12 nanometer. Yeah, that's the, they, their defect rate must be terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to this. I think, I, I personally think we will see uh, Volta GPUs early in 2018. I wouldn't, you know, I think by this time next year we'll already have, um, you know, Volta GPUs out there. Do you think we'll get a refresh of the 10 series before Volta lands? Uh, I really hope not. I really hope not, but I've heard I've heard a lot of people talk about that before. I don't I don't want to knock on AMD, but was the 500 series really necessary? Uh, no, it, def it definitely was not necessary. But I 
Actually, I know a lot of people were comparing that to like what NVIDIA did with the 6 to the 700 series, but even with that, we've got the 780, which was, you know, much faster than the 680. So at least they put out one GPU that was significantly better while they just kind of refreshed from what was the high-end GPU. The last end is now this, the mid-end one this time around. So I didn't really have too much of an issue with the 6 to 700 series refresh, if you want to call it that, because the 780 and 780 Ti were monsters in comparison to the 600 series. Well, the king of refreshes, I don't know if you remember back at the uh, 8800 GTX, GTS, and 800, 8800 GT, and then the 9800 GT, and then the GTS 250? Yes. They had three generations in a row that were a rebrand, and in fact, you could take an 8800 and a GTS 250 and SLI them, and they didn't care. They worked perfectly. Sorry, something was so, something was distracting me in the chat because I saw this come up the last time we were talking about Xeons with Wendell. Is that is it seems the audience has an issue with your pronunciation of Xeon. You say Xenon. <laughs> I've always, I, look, everybody always has something to say about my pronunciation of words. I I okay, how is it pronounced? Xeon. Xeon? Yeah. I always yeah, okay. Xeon. <laughs> I must be driving everyone nuts. It, yeah, there was, oh. there was. Well, the last time we were really talking about Xeons a lot, it, I saw it come up quite a few times, and then it happened again just now, and I noticed it, and someone else noticed it in the chat, so I was just like, you know what? Let's just let's just bring it up here. I I take no offense. I called a Zeus a Zeus for twenty years, so I'm still not I'm still not sure which one's right on that. I call it Asus or Asus. I, I've, I call it Asus or Asus. Not, Just not, never call your use. company an easy to pronounce name that no one can get wrong. Look, AMD is easy. No one can mess that up. <laughs> AMD. Well, okay, there you go. Well, hey, hey, man, for for years in the '90s, like during like AOL days, I thought HTML was actually a word, Hatumel, and I used to say it as such in my head whenever I would read HTML. I'd say Hatumel, colon slash slash. So we all have our things. Sure. What's next? All right. Up next is, I guess we already went over the Vega GPUs and everything, so really is Vanquish, which I am pumped about. I, I love this game. I played it. We had talked about this a few weeks back when there was after Bayonetta came out on PC, and I was saying how much I would love to see Vanquish come to the PC because it's from Platinum Games, the same developer who did Bayonetta, and they also did a couple other titles since then. They did, I believe, a Ninja Turtles game. They also did a Transformers game. They put out some quality, like, melee combat games, but this is actually it was a third-person action shooter, kind of like Gears of War, but with a, a more of a sci-fi twist, and you could, like, slide across the map, and it, the just the combat was insane in this game. So I'm happy this is going to be coming to PC. They're going to say unlocked frame rates. So they're they're going to have, like, 4K support, no limit on resolution, hopefully ultra-wide as well. And the recommended system requirements are looking pretty reasonable. For the GPU, they're saying a GTX 660 Ti or a Radeon R9 270. So hopefully a good PC port for Vanquish because the combat in that game, like I said, just a total blast. And if this comes out and it's affordable, hopefully uh, new people get to play it. So long as Ubisoft is not doing the port, it'll be fine. Yeah, and I agree with uh, Khan in the chat. Vanquish is fucking amazing. Played it on the Xbox 360, loved it to death. I got all the achievements in that game, and I will play through it again for sure on the PC. I can't wait to see it in 60 frames. Even just lo- watching the trailer, like in 60 FPS with the animations and everything, was just like, oh my god. We just got to, had to miss out on all of this in console. <clears throat> you know, you don't have a topic on it, so we probably shouldn't get into it since we don't have a link for it. But, you know, you mentioned, you know, frame rate. One of the downsides to consoles is so many console games are either resolution limited or, you know, 30 FPS limited, whereas the PC can run 60. Um, It'll be interesting to see what Sony and Microsoft's experiment with coming out with mid-life console upgrades with Scorpio and with PlayStation Pro, if more games get a patch to run at 60 FPS on these new consoles. Um... You know, if they make that too much like the PC, I think that's going to drive away why why people buy consoles. But at the same time, 
uh, I'll never say no to going from 30 to 60 FPS. I mean, that's that's a nice improvement. Yeah, that, what, just going back to what you were saying about the consoles, that the whole mid mid um, generation upgrade thing really annoyed me from the standpoint of it's like it's like they're trying to push this 4K thing so hard, which is really just not even really 4K. It's like 1440p with temporal filtering, but. I mean, I, as a, if I was a console gamer, I would be much more happy about a mid-generation upgrade if they were just targeting 1080p 60fps versus going to a pseudo 4K and keeping the same abysmal frame rate. Like, just give me the, give me a guaranteed 1080p 60fps, and that's and I'm and I'm fine. I would have kept my PS4 if they would have brought out more 60fps games. I was waiting on the new Uncharted to come out to be 1080 60fps, but I found out the campaign wasn't. And I was just like, all right, well, then I don't need this system anymore because I'm done with Last of Us. So it's just uh, it's a shame that they are choosing to go after the higher resolution and they can't even seem to do 108060 yet. I think resolution sells and people don't understand. I mean, the lay person, I mean, you, you understand it. I understand it. Our viewers, I'm sure, understand it. But the, the, the average soccer mom understands... 4K and they've heard 4K and and the, they're riding on the coattails of that. What I think is disappointing and I, it, it's probably worth making a video of 1080p at a higher quality detail setting at a smooth, consistent frame rate. I think in many regards looks better than 1440p or 4K with the detail turned down and a choppy frame rate. I absolutely agree 100%. Because resolution is one thing. I mean, but all that is is how sharp the lines on the screen are. If your textures are, are terrible or your frame rate is bad, you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, and Dumb Awesome Gaming asked in the chat, is temporal filtering the same as checkerboarding? And, yeah, it's basically a checkerboard rendering method, um, temporal filtering. If you want to see a, a good example of it, you can look at Rainbow Six Siege. If you have that game, you can – I mean, I've – you know, switched over between different systems before, like to a GTX 1060, but while well, I was still on like a 1440, 144 hertz monitor, and I could just switch on temporal filtering, and I'll still get well over 100 frames in that game and not have to touch the graphics at all because it is effectively taking 1440p, rendering at half resolution, then applying two times MSAA, and yeah, it is a checkerboard rendering, so you get all the problems that come along with that when you turn really fast. Sometimes you'll see some blockiness things along those lines, reduced uh, resolution as far as textures are concerned. So it's it's not ideal, and if sitting at a monitor, it's a lot more apparent than probably it is on a 50-inch TV. So that's probably why console gamers are mostly okay with it. But yeah, I'd rather have the frame rate. And I'd rather have the choice. I mean, I'd rather... Yeah, give me the choice. I, That'd be if great If you too. look, for example, at, at Mass Effect Andromeda, the, um, the the presets on details, if you're, if you're above 1080p resolution... And you set it to anything but ultra preset, it auto scales the internal render resolution down to 1080p. And if you're not looking closely, you'll miss it. Yeah. You have to go to custom to turn that off. So you might be running at 4K. You set it to high detail. It's rendering at 1080p. Yeah, they actually do that on Rainbow Six Siege again with the temporal filtering option. No matter what option you use, low, medium, high, very high, ultra, all of those presets will default the temporal filtering option to turn on. So a lot of people will be sitting there saying, oh, I'm playing 1440p maxed out and I'm getting 150 FPS. This is great. It's like, yeah, but just go just go turn temporal filtering to off. Don't put on any additional anti-aliasing and your frame rate's going to get cut by probably 50%. Because it's just it just gets bundled in there. And that's that I don't like. I don't like seeing that bundled in as a default option. But I do agree with you that it would be nice to have the choice on console. Just have a toggle to say, what hey, do, do you want 1080 or do you want 4K 30? Yeah. I think most people would take the 10, 1080 60 FPS if they actually know what they're talking about. <laughs> the type of people that would want that well, option. It would anyway. give people a chance to try both and, and then decide for themselves because you can talk all you want, you can read all you want, but when, when you experience something, a lot of times a minute of experiencing something is worth all the conversation in the world. Yep. And. Speaking of uh, frame rates, resolutions, and all that, Nixius, they've got a monitor out, the EDG, or just Edge 27 for simplicity's sake, has uh, just come out, and it's got some pretty damn good specs for $399, 1440p, 144Hz, you know, 4 millisecond response time, IPS, 
and it's got free sync and the range on the free sync is 30 to 144 hertz which is awesome so it's really checking all the boxes looks like it's got you know high-end monitor stand features you can tilt pivot swivel and height adjust the the stand actually reminds me a lot of the acer predator stands with the red feet except these ones are black almost identical though in shape i like the black feet better i abs i agree a acer has started to fade out uh phase out the the red feet though so and that's I noticed good. that it has a uh, a pivot, so you you have the option of of a portrait mode if you want, which is nice. Yeah, very nice. And yeah, it's three ninety nine. This is kind of the same exact price point as my Pixio monitor behind me. Um, the difference being here is that this has a better stand, arguably, and also a better free sync range. Even though the free sync range on the other one is pretty damn good. And you still get um, AMD's low frame rate compensation because it has you know, the, the whatever the range is works within that. But 30 to 144 is undeniably better. We're not seeing that on enough FreeSync displays. So seeing that basically my, my, getting uh, same as G-Sync. My only uh, comment regarding that is: Would you explain to me why a monitor that that is being sold and pitched as 144 hertz, free sync, variable frame rate, all these features, there are four display inputs, only one of which you can really use? True. There's two HDMI and a DVI, and one Display Port. But if you want 144 hertz at 1440p, it, you, you can only use the Display Port. Well, it's nice to have. A f Some people can only afford to have one display, but maybe they want to switch between different devices. If they wanted to, maybe just plug in a laptop as an external display or hook up a console, you know, and they're all at one set up with one monitor. Well, that's true, but Display Port works with HDMI, so. A display port to HDMI cable would fix that. If you had three display port inputs under there rather than the, H the HDMI, if you have, as you say, a laptop or say a PlayStation Pro, you could plug in display port to HDMI and get. So it gives you the choice of what you want to plug into as opposed to being limited. But yeah, I know, I know what you're saying. Fair, fair enough on the HDMI. What's the DVI doing on there? <laughs> Well, I think probably because that's the only alternative to the display port that would allow you to at least get the higher resolution and refresh rate compared to HDMI. So at least you can get the 144 hertz out of DVI. But yeah, it won't it won't do 1440p though, will it? At 144? I think it would do 1080p at 144. I'm not sure about 1440p. I think you would run into it'll do 1440p at 60 hertz. Right. It would. Or 1080p at 144. I think. Yes, I believe you're right. Yeah. I don't know. I just like lots of inputs. I actually use multiple inputs on more than one of my monitors, and it's kind of one of my things. I mean, some people want to be some out. Some people want, you know, different features. There's just been times where I've actually wanted multiple display ports. Maybe I'm the only one. <laughs> yeah, it would, no, it would be nice sometimes, but I've, I've never personally had a use for it, and I would be all over this monitor. I would, I would love to uh, check it out and use it. Because right now the uh, the best well, competition I, I have for it is I the Pixio, and this it seems better. Four milli Sorry, I do notice that it has a four millisecond uh, grade to grade response time, which for IPS is basically as good as it gets. It does have speakers, which is nice. Um, if you are looking for a deal on a monitor, I think you found it. I, that's what I was going to say. Is this is this tech deal certified deals? Yes. <laughs> I would buy it if I was in the market. My challenge is that you might say, well, why don't I get one and, and review it? Because it won't be here in a week. <laughs> What's the normal cost going to be, 500 Uh Yeah, they're saying 499 regular without the mass drop deal. It'll be interesting to see what the price ends up being when it's on Amazon and Newegg and... and uh... yeah, even we if... need some competition in monitors because, let's be honest, Acer and Asus... No offense, kind of charges a lot of money. If you look at what they charge for their 27 inch IPS 144 hertz 1440p displays, it's a lot. Well, Dell has certainly been getting uh, a lot better as far as um, having more gaming monitor options, I think, for people. I've seen a lot of, uh, when I've been doing a lot of Acer reviews, people are like, oh, did you see the, this Dell one that's pretty similar in terms of specs and all that and doing really good? 
I have liked Dell monitors for a long time. You know, I think someone in my house is using the internet, so I'm just texting them to not. That's what I was thinking. The yeah, that the Acer Predator with the red feet is currently seven hundred and forty dollars on Amazon, and this is four hundred. That's a screaming deal. Now that's a G Sync monitor. I guess this is Free Sync, but still. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's get into the uh, the next topic, with which is the hard drive stats for the first quarter of twenty seventeen. I like looking at these backblaze stats anytime that they put them up. Um, and I noticed on this time that they actually included it for going from April 2013 all the way until March of 2017, March 31st. So that's a pretty, you know, good uh, test size, test period to look at. And we could see there the HDSTs are by far the best in terms of failure rate. And that's, I've been using these for a few years now, particularly the four terabyte drives. And the, those things just seem to last. They just have not died on me. I like the fact that Backblaze uh, releases this sort of information. I like the fact that they open source their their um, their pod design. They seem to be a company run by people who get technology and realize that having a a good attitude about working with with customers, working with other companies, and being open with some information serves them. Too many companies don't discuss anything internal and I think that let me put it this way this sort of information actually gives me more confidence in using them as a backup service than some of the other companies because what this tells me is that they take this seriously they analyze the numbers and they're making sure that they don't get surprised by equipment failures and so my data is safe if I choose to use them for backup some companies might not want to release this saying oh yeah we have hard drives who fail Everyone has hard drives fail. I mean, nobody owns tens of thousands of hard drives and doesn't have a hard drive fail. So the fact that they released this tells me that they get it, and I don't know that every company does. Regarding the HGST, they, they definitely are the best. And, of course, if you look at the list, the Seagates, um, the Seagates they have the most of. They have 34,000 drives of the 4 terabyte size. They've got a 3.1% failure rate on that. Um, that's pretty dreadful, quite frankly. And, it, it, you know, I have no idea why. I mean, your guess is as good as mine. But um, all hard drives fail. The, the thing I would suggest that people take away from this is if you buy hard drives thinking, I'm going to buy this drive versus that drive because it's more reliable, it is until it fails. Yep. If you're not backing up your data... Well, these uh, these HGST the NAS drives I choose to use those because I usually have uh, four of them in this in the same system, and with these with their NAS drives anyway they have an anti vibration technology built into them for the platters so that if they if you have them in the type of configuration that they, these would be in like a server rack with dozens of other drives you want you want to make sure that that's not going to be affected by the neighboring drives because of the vibrations. So they have anti-vibration in there for the platters and stuff like that. So they they say that at least HGST says that contributes to the longer lifespan of their drives when they are in a system next to multiples. So that's kind of what attracted me to using them. So whether or not that contributes to them having a much lower failure rate compared to the others, then something might be worth looking at. I mean, they're 0.7% versus, you know, Seagate, like you were saying, 3%. I'm um, trying to find other ones that have comparable numbers to the HGST. They had 15,000 being used. Seagate, one of their 8 terabytes, was almost 10,000 10, units being used, and that had a 1.6% failure rate annually. So even that is more than double what HGST was seeing. Um, I don't know how many of the blogs you've read. I actually keep up with these blogs. I've been reading them for a while now. I've actually been a, a, a customer of Backblaze for over two years now, long before I had a YouTube channel. Um, all of my YouTube videos, all of my data is backed up with Backblaze. And um, one of the comments they made in a blog a while ago is that they've done an analysis of the NAS drives versus the consumer desktop drives. And the long and short of it is, yes, the NAS drives have a lower failure rate. But they cost more. 
And when they did the math on the price of the drive versus the failure rate, most of the time, they actually come out ahead buying the consumer drives and just letting them fail more often. But that works for them because they have tens of thousands of drives and changing drives. They have full-time employees who do nothing but change drives all day. And so it's no big deal for them to absorb more drive changes because they're always taking pods on and offline and the data is replicated in three separate places. If, if it's somebody like you, Joker, for example, and you've got four drives and that's the only four drives you have and you're not in the business of changing out drives, yeah, buying the NAS drives probably does make sense because the last thing you need is a, de is a whole day lost of changing out drives and screwing around with it. Whereas to them, they got three people sitting over there doing it anyway. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it definitely makes sense. So I if, if um, I would buy the NAS drives if you're only buying a few. But if you're buying 10,000, then actually it doesn't matter. Yeah, but like you said, that's why I bought them because I have I have four of them in raids, so I can have uh, backups of anything. I keep all my storage for my my files and stuff on there, so I can have it back up to, backed up instantly for all my YouTube stuff and my B-roll files. So it's important for me to have those drives around. Kind of important. <laughs> don't know what that I would do if I look. That data accumulates quickly, doesn't it? Yeah, I don't know what is going on with uh, with the network. I don't know if it's if it's Skype or my network, but you're you're you've gone down to like 144p. Hang on a second. Let's try this. You have to promise not to laugh because I feel real dumb at the moment. What would you do? Uh, I had a... <laughs> Let me know if that's any better. It's getting there. Yeah. I wasn't even... In fact, there is a connection. It should pick up here in a second. Um... I wasn't even thinking about it. Yep, I good. was copying a file across my network. Ah, there you go. So it was on your end. I'm sitting here it like was on my end. I'm, was. I'm sitting here. I'm sitting here texting my my girlfriend. I'm like, is anyone down there using the Wi-Fi? It's like, no, no, no one's using the Wi-Fi. I'm like, are you sure? Are you watching Hulu? That counts as Wi-Fi. <laughs> but no, it was Tech Deal's fault. He was copying a file over the network. Let me let me open up and see if it's I you know what I was just moving some files around from this machine that I'm sitting on and yeah what are you what are you seeding over there what kind of torrents no actually <laughs> um, I I did a Twitch stream yesterday and I recorded it it was a three hour and six minute um, Twitch stream but I recorded it at 4K locally uh -huh. and it was a 70 gigabyte file and I was just moving it across my network. To, just because I was sitting here, I was just moving it across the network to my main storage machine, mm -hmm. and it was just dominating my Ethernet connection. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, well, we got to sort it out before. That was my fault. It's all right. I I didn't even it didn't even put two and two together. That's funny. My girl, anyway, my girlfriend will laugh about that afterwards, and I was yelling at her to shut off all the all the Hulu and everything. My <laughs> my I just I'm. What can I say? Um, need more. Actually, the the interesting thing about that is is, of course, again another topic you don't have a, a link for, and it's really a separate conversation in itself. I have actually been debating about whether or not it's worth upgrading my home network from one gigabit to five, which my understanding can be done on Cat6 cable, whereas ten gigabit Ethernet requires. Whatever's above that Cat 7 or the Cat 6E or whatever's in between, which I don't have in my house, and I don't want to spend the money to rewire the house. I, I do have a hard wire to most of the rooms in my house. Um, with all of the videos and the copying of files I'm doing around with my YouTube channel, there are times where I'm actually finding that my local gigabit Ethernet connection is a little slow for that. Like right now, this wouldn't have been an issue if I'd had five instead of one. Yeah, I'm still dealing with my crappy upload speed over here. I know. I'll play the world's smallest violin for myself. <laughs> oh, man. Are you going to make that violin out of your fiber optic lines that are running to your house? Yeah. You mean two different companies that will offer me fiber optic service? Yeah. Yes. Oh, God, I hate you. I know. And by the way, you know, I switched from Verizon to AT&T because Verizon was only offering me 150 up and down and AT&T offered me gigabit up and down. I just got a notice from Verizon saying, come back, we're now offering gigabit in your area up and down. 
for for anyone that's having trouble keeping along, Tech Deals give me crap about my my shitty internet options over here with Comcast. Meanwhile, he has two different competing ISPs trying to give him gigabit service. Eighty bucks a month, uncapped, up and down, synchronous. That's awesome. I gotta I gotta move to Texas. I and am so unbelievably blessed. I'm never moving. I mean, that is I'm never moving. That's all there is to it. If, well, if you're if you're gonna stay there for a while, you might want to get yourself a, a a solar roof from Tesla. How do you like that transition? Uh, that's an excellent transition. Um, my comments about this are somewhat related to Texas. I've had solar priced on my house twice, and we could talk about that in a minute. But first, go ahead with the with the news. Yeah, so these solar roof tiles, they've been kind of in the news for a while, but now it looks like they are available for pre-order. Though I couldn't, I couldn't seem to track down any actual pricing yet on these. They keep on saying it's going to cost the same as a normal roof, plus the cost of electricity. But what they are, you know, quantifying into that cost of electricity is that for one year of electricity, the cost of electricity needed to install a roof, a lifetime worth of electricity. <laughs> What's the, you know, what is the final price on it? Because this is something I would definitely, you know, look after as I'm in the kind of in the market for looking for a house eventually in the next year or two to buy a house. So doing something like this would be awesome, I think, being able to save on the energy and without sacrificing the looks of your home also is kind of what it's going to appeal to a lot of people now. Because that was the big, you know, thing holding people back previously is that it was ugly as hell. Or maybe the cost, as you were saying there. Cost. My, my problem is I live in Texas and our, our power is ridiculously cheap. Um, my wife, for those of you who don't know, my wife is from Australia. And the price per kilowatt that they pay in uh, Queensland in Australia mm -hmm. is about 26 cents per kilowatt hour. And there's quite a few people there with solar because at 26 cents per kilowatt hour, um, solar can actually make sense. And the government there has done some rebates and discounts and stuff to incentivize people to install it. I know California is really big with solar right now. And of course, the government there is subsidizing some of that. Hawaii is huge. I read somewhere that like 25% of homes in Hawaii now have some type of solar system because the price for solar, the price for electricity out there is I think 37 or 39 cents per kilowatt hour because you know they import everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, all up, everything included, including taxes and fees, I pay 10 cents a kilowatt hour for power. Wow. Solar doesn't make any sense at 10 cents a kilowatt hour for power. It just, no amount of looking sideways at the number sheets, essentially it comes down to this. The panels are a buck a watt per panel for good panels. But by the time you have it installed and you put inverters on the roof and you put the, the rack mounts on the roof and you get the, the second meter put on the wall and you get the wiring hooked up, it's $3 a watt. So putting a um, 10 kilowatt system on the roof would be $30,000. The various incentives and rebates brings that cost down to about $20,000. But at 10 cents a kilowatt hour, the payback period is, ba is basically infinity. Now, that is an add-on to a roof with those big ugly panels. Here's what's interesting about the Telsa solar roof. If you needed a roof put on anyway, let's say your roof was damaged by hail, it was, it, it's old, and you are going to spend the money to put a roof on anyway, it is entirely possible that cost issue might stop being an issue because you already have to have guys come out and get on your roof because you're putting a roof on. Mm -hmm. So if this can come out for a price that makes sense, um, I may be from Texas, but I'm all for renewable energy. I mean, Texas, a lot of people may not know this. Texas is the number one producer of wind power in the United States. So I'm totally for renewable energy, but not at $30,000 I'm not. So, you know, you mentioned that you're going to be looking for a house here at some point. Um, absolutely. If, if it makes sense economically, why wouldn't you want to use the power from the sun? I mean, and sell it back and sell the leftovers back to the city. <laughs> or if you scroll down that article, you said they talked about, I think they talked about the Powerwall, you know, tell, yeah, the Powerwall 2.0. If you can put a battery pack in your garage, um, or depending upon if you're, you know, depending on what part of the country from your garage. Your garage. <laughs> garage, garage. Um, if you can put a battery pack so you can charge it up during the day when you're at work and then use it at night, you basically use your own power and then you don't have any, you know, you don't have to mess with the selling back rates and net metering and all that stuff. So 
if the, I'm just waiting for the cost to get down. And if they can get the cost down, then I'm all for it. What about 3D printed roof tiles, solar roof tiles? That'll be the next uh, frontier. I think that 3D printing looks primitive today. I think that our children will look at us as being primitive going, what were you idiots doing not 3D printing everything, not understanding where it was? It's kind of like laser printers in the 80s were, you know, $3,000 and printed it four pages a minute. And now they're 50 bucks and they print it 30 pages a minute and they're throwaway items. Yeah, I have, um, I have, I have no doubt that'll, that'll come in the future. You know, the kids won't go to the store to buy the new pair of Jordans. They'll just pay for a license to print one. That'll make uh, that that'll make Amazon Prime delivery seem slow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even the uh, day one deliveries. All yeah, right. I, if you can have it in thirty minutes from your own three D printer, then you know it's. Uh... Yeah. All right. So moving on to this next one regarding Steam and their algorithm based game recommendations. They've had game recommendations for a while, but we usually don't get as much inside info inside info as to why. They may have recommended that game to us, and you might think, oh, you know, maybe because I played something similar to it. And that can certainly be a factor, but it also looks like it'll work in, you know, whether or not you have friends that have played that game, or if they're recommended by curators that you follow, or if maybe you always tend to play games that have very positive uh, user reviews. Then all of these things can come into the factor, and now they'll actually list them as to why they're saying that you may like this game because of so-and-so reasons. Which I think is I think is good because it's one thing to recommend a game to me; it's another to recommend it for a reason. So I'll, I think this will definitely help out a lot of people with looking for games to buy. I yeah, it might. Um, me personally, I don't think I have ever bought a game because it ended up on a recommended list. But the, but do you but do you think it's because it was on a recommended list or because you didn't know why it was being recommended? Because if I have a friend that recommends a game, sometimes that usually that won't be enough for them to say, hey, you should check this game out. I'll say, well, why should you check it out? And they might say, oh, well, it's from the same developer that worked on this game that you liked. And I'll be like, oh, okay, I might have to check it out then. You know, if, if you start getting a you know like a list of reasons like that as to why you might like it, then I think that might go a long way for some people. It, well, fair enough. I, nobody asked me. Um, I miss the days when companies actually put out demos. If you want me to try your game, let me play it for two hours for free. Well, that's what they have the refund thing for now. I think I just saw something the other day where they said that on, an, on a daily basis, they refund somewhere around 50,000 uh, games to people for refund. So yeah, but people. that's a pain to request. I mean, uh, but I grew up in the online BBS days when shareware existed. You know, you got the first level to Doom, and then you sent in your money to get the rest of it. You got the or you just pirated the, the rest of it because it was usually uploaded anyway. <laughs> I would never do that. Well, I mean, well, with Doom, it was almost encouraged. I felt by the developers. The funny thing about that is for all the whinging of piracy, I noticed that John Carmack and uh, John um, – uh, who was the other John? John Carmack oh, and John uh, – the, the two Johns at ID. Yeah, I know you're talking about – I don't know why the name is escaping me now because I follow him on Twitter. The other guy who diverged and created the Decana game that completely bombed and he just lost his mind. Poor guy. Uh, uh, somebody in chat should mention who it is. But in any case, um, I, I grew up in that scene. And, of course, I, I live in the in the Dallas, Texas area, and ID grew up here. I mean, I, I remember when they went, went to First Saturday downtown, and they went to uh, – that was a big part of the scene back in those days. And I was active on the bulletin boards back, back in those days on a 386 <laughs> computer. <laughs> yeah, John John Romero, that's it. I don't know why that's I couldn't think it. I don't know why Romero, I couldn't think of it because I follow him. Um they, you know, and and I don't remember off the top of my head while they split and it's not important, but I just remember days when you would try games and if you liked it, um 
you would then pay for the rest of it, the Commander Keen days, the Duke, nu uh, the Duke Nukem days, um, back when Duke Nukem was a cool game. Anyway. Uh, talking, regarding the suggestions, ago. oh, the other thing in your article that you linked is, in addition to that, if you scroll down to the bottom, uh, there's a comment in there about the recent changes to gifting. Did you talk about that two weeks ago, or is that new as well? No, I haven't had a chance to talk about that yet. I wasn't really too sure what the changes were to the gifting. Um, you can't buy games for gifting and store them in your inventory for later sending. You have to send them immediately when you buy them. Okay, so that's is that so is that even for games purchased on Steam? Yes. Interesting. If you buy a game on Steam, it has to go to somebody right away. It either has to go into your account or you have to Now, you can schedule it in the future. Let's say uh, your your buddy has got a, a birthday coming up in 3 weeks. Let's say uh, you want to give a, a gift to your nephew for Christmas. You can schedule, you can buy latest game X and say, send this on December 15th, and it will sit in reserve on his account, and he won't know about it until that day. But the reason they're doing this is because so many people are buying up games on the Steam sales, and they're, they're, they're saving them, and then they're turning around and selling them on the key sites, on like the Kingwins and G2As and eBay. Mm -hmm. And so they're trying to put a stop to that. They're trying to get control of their keys again. That makes sense. Because if you go on to places like Kingwin, you'll see some of the games say Steam Key, and then others say Steam Gift. Yes. And if you buy it, you actually get sent a Steam Gift from a Steam account rather than a key. Yeah, I've, I'm no stranger to that. I've bought many games off of G2A in the past, but it's been ages since I've actually used them, since all this stuff has come up about them. So, yeah, I think it's it's a good thing. If they're doing anything to kind of curb that type of thing from happening, then I think it's it's probably for the best. Well, I don't generally buy games and store them in my inventory, so it doesn't affect me. But uh, for some reason, people seem to be upset about it. But I would ask the question... Why are you buying games as gifts and not sending them to somebody? I mean, who? Well, maybe somebody in chat can can answer this. The only, it, well, the only time this has come up for me really is if I buy a game that maybe has other games bundled in with it that I already own, or if I go somewhere like Humble Bundle and I'll maybe I'll, it'll say ten pay ten bucks to get these like eight games and I might already own two or three of them, but I want the other five then I would like to take the other ones, the remaining, and put those in my inventory until I could find a, find a friend to gift them to. So that's definitely happened to me in the past with Humble Bundle stuff. My understanding with the Humble Bundles is uh, it's been a couple of months. It's probably been three or four months since I bought a Humble Bundle. I used to buy a bunch until I discovered that I really never played the games that I bought. I was just giving money to charity, which is not a bad thing, mind you. Um, I have way too many Steam games that I've never played. So... My understanding is that you can store the Steam key with Humble Bundle. If you don't redeem it, you can gift those in the future. It's the games you buy directly through the Steam store that you have to gift right away. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. In any case, that kind of diverges off of the recommendation topic, but it is on the link that you put on there, so I thought I'd mention it because it's at the bottom of the page. Oh, yeah, I, I did uh, see that on there, but I wasn't aware of what the changes were. So thank you for bringing it up. All I can say is that I'm glad that we have Steam because if EA's Origin and Ubisoft's Uplay were our only online digital download services, I'd be grumpy. I mean, Steam's not perfect, but considering all the other options, we could have worse. Yeah. I've actually found Uplay to be pretty stable recently. Haven't had any my biggest complaint, and this is going to sound ridiculous, my complaint with Origin and Uplay is I can't be logged into more than one machine at a time. Yeah, that's annoying. Oh, come on. I mean, really, I, do, you, do you have any idea how many computers I have that stuff installed on? Yeah, it's, it's no. annoying because I always have you play open on this computer, but I'll go ben benchmark on another computer and come back and be like, oh, you've been signed out. Yeah, seriously. I mean, look, I, with Steam, if you are signed into five machines, if you launch a game on one and then you launch a game on another, for, for anybody watching who doesn't know, you can be signed in to Steam on like, five or ten different machines. 
But if you launch a game on one machine and then you go onto another machine and then try to launch a game, it'll say the other machine will be logged out. So it only lets you play on one computer at a time, but you can just leave the you can leave the program open. So like if you have a laptop and a desktop, you can have all your games downloaded and installed on both machines. You just can't play on both at the same time. But with Origin and Uplay, it actually logs you out and makes you log back in and it's just especially for for us, which we have a lot of machines that we test with, it's it's a pain in the pain on the butt. Yep, for sure. Uh World's okay. smallest bio. <laughs> <laughs> Once again. Um, so this yeah, this next one, you had sent me this earlier. Do you want to take a lead on this one, the DDoS attacks with Last Week Tonight segment? Yes. Um, John Oliver, for those of you who don't know, John Oliver has a show called Last Week Tonight on HBO. Um, he does in-depth deep dives on topics, and he's been doing this for a couple of years now, and he tackles topics in in detail and depth that isn't normally covered. And usually he is absolutely spot on the money. And he covered net neutrality this past Sunday. And basically he talked about how absolutely ridiculous, if you have not seen it, go onto YouTube and type in last week tonight, net neutrality, watch it. Because he absolutely obliterates the ISP's argument for, oh, we don't need Title II protection. It's no big deal. We'll be on our best behavior, Scouts Honor. They are so full of it, it's not funny. And and he, I mean, he just, from one to the next to the next, he very clearly disintegrates um, the ISP's arguments for why they just, anyway, I won't get into that. But what I will say is what he did is he pointed out how you go to the FCC, because there's an open comment period right now. And even while you're watching this, you can go do this right now. The FCC, you can go to FCC.gov, click on one place, go to another page, type in the specific proposed rule, go to the next page page after clicking search, scroll down. It's like seven different clicks and you'll never find it, which is the point because they don't really want you to comment. So what John Oliver did is created a, he bought the domain name, gofccyourself.com. Yes, clever. And it auto directs you to the comment page for the net neutrality because what they what the FCC is proposing with Trump's new FCC head is to delete the Title II protections, meaning that without the Title II protections, Verizon, for example, could decide that your Netflix is now low priority traffic and it's going to be slowed down, or Comcast could decide that uh, YouTube should be slowed down. Under Title II protection, they can't. Under the rules right now, ISPs have to treat all bits the same. And so the new FCC chairman wants to get rid of it. And his argument is it's stifling competition and consumers don't really need it because the ISPs have promised to be on their best behavior. So the point of this news article, I know it's a long story to get there, but I'm saving you all the trouble of reading it. Um, The FCC is claiming that their feedback website, their website was brought down by last week tonight because so many people, I mean, millions and millions of people watched watched John Oliver. So many people went to gofccyourself.com, which auto forwards you to the FCC's website that it basically crashed their website, which is a good thing. This should tell them that this is a problem. And it's not Um, the first time it happened either. It happened the last time he did a story on net neutrality. He did the same thing. And it brought it down as well. So, do I sound point. passionate? We, do I sound passionate about this topic? It I, does. It does sound like you're, you're you've know a lot about this topic. I can tell. I pay for my internet connection to access whatever information I want. I don't want Verizon or AT and T or Comcast deciding that this website should get better service than that website. Um, it, look, sell me a pipe. Let me use it for whatever I want. Stay out of my internet. It's it's a, it's a utility. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, in 2017, the internet is essentially a public utility. We, we all use it. The vast, vast majority of Americans use it every day for paying bills, for online banking, for accessing government services, um, healthcare, going to healthcare.gov. I mean, it, it's an essential public service. So playing favorites, I think... Um, it's it's really just it's a really the way of the the cable companies trying to keep their last grasp of of being able to make money off of these little you know parting everything out 
Because if they had their way, they would be able to sell all of us, you know, okay, well, you pay your 80 bucks a month for your gigabit package. And but unless you want to pay the extra twenty dollars a month for the streaming bundle, then you're going to get really slow service to sling Netflix, Hulu, HBO, anytime, all that stuff. So if you're one of those cut the cable people that wants to go start using a Roku full time, then you're going to have to pay extra for the streaming bundle. And if you want to use YouTube, it's going to be an extra extra fee for that. If that's not antitrust, I don't know what is. Yeah, but the the people the the congressmen that get behind us are the people that are in. You know, are in the pocket of the Optimums and the Verizons. Verizon's one of the biggest ones. Comcast, though, you know, all these companies that would serve to profit the most from it are the ones but that Joker, are, you know, backing the politicians. I thought you loved Comcast. Oh, fuck Comcast. <laughs> I would, like, if, if, if Comcast was a literal being, I would find them and shove a broom handle up their ass sideways. And that would be, that would not be, that would only be the start of it. It might make me feel a little bit better. But yeah, Comcast is awful. All I know is that... All I know, and I don't want to get into politics because that's a dangerous topic, so we're not going to talk about that, but I, I will say that um, anytime you have a situation where a few wealthy corporations can benefit over here and tens of millions of ordinary citizens can benefit over here... To me, that's an easy decision, but what do I know? Yep. Uh, the people, obviously. I, I think I think that the internet should be left alone, and I think that people should have equal access to the internet because it's just it's, it's an essential public service. It's it's like roads, it's like power, or it's like phones were 20 years ago. Especially when it doesn't cost them anything extra to give you the extra bandwidth to those sites. It's just them trying to find a way to screw you. They're just trying they're to adding, hold on to the cable business. They're yeah, just trying to hold on to the video and cable business as long as they can. Because all the ISPs now, Verizon, AT&T, Comcast, Time Warner, all sell television bundles. And, you know, it's not in this article here, but um, there was a comment about the number of people cutting the cord. And I forget what the number is, but it's it's growing at huge rates. I mean, the number of people who are canceling their their cable bit service and they're just streaming as you said with a Roku or with you know Netflix or Prime or I can't tell you how many people in my family and in my girlfriend's family who I have personally walked through cutting the cord to help them along with doing that like cuz they'll, they'll see you know what I'm using they'll and they'll be like oh what do you mean you don't have cable like no like well what do you pay a month like I pay for my internet and then I pay you know this much for all, for all my services and I have everything like, I'm never without a TV show to watch or a movie to watch at night, ever. And they're just like, oh, how do I do that? It's like, well, you just go buy a Roku stick for 40 bucks, and we'll go from there. <laughs> and actually, um, it's worth noting that uh, AT&T, which bought DirecTV, the satellite service, a year or three ago, is now trialing. Um, I don't think they've actually launched it or they're about to launch it. But they're trialing a, a new service that they're branding under the DirecTV name but it will not be satellite. Uh, it, there's been an announcement. It's it's on the web. You can you can Google this. But essentially, what they're going to offer is a, bundles of channels, like 20 channels or 30 channels, that you stream over your internet connection the way you do with Netflix and Prime and Hulu. But they're just going to sell it under the Directv brand. Um, I think it's similar to what is the service from Dish? Uh, Sling 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 TV? Sling. Yes, I use Sling. Is that what it is? Yeah, is that what it's called? I don't know if that's... Um, I don't know if it was owned by DirecTV. Well, Sling is Dish Network. AT&T owns DirecTV, but DirecTV is planning on launching that service sometime this year. And YouTube, actually, uh, is going to be offering a service with, I think, 35 yeah. channels. I heard about that. As, yeah, I did hear about that. I, I will the, check the, it out for sure. The days of buying channels via a dedicated service are so doomed it's not funny. I mean, let's be honest. That's why I mean I pay for some channels now, like but I have like I have someone asked in the chat what I services I pay for. I have I have Sling for my live TV and stuff like that. Then I've got Hulu, I've got Netflix, I've got HBO anytime and then Showtime anytime or HBO Go or whatever, I don't know. Basically HBO Showtime, Netflix, Hulu and Sling. Yeah, now that you can buy HBO and just stream it directly, um, which we do as well, we watch several HB HBO shows. Um, anybody watching this who hasn't seen Westworld, amazing, mm -hmm. very very cool. Or um, last week tonight. 
I'm sorry. Well, and well, there's last week tonight. There's <laughs> Westworld. There's and of course, then they have the whole back catalog. I mean, shoot, for for a reasonable price, there's there's more content there than you can ever consume. Don't, In any don't, case, so don't, the whole point of this nonsense me. is leave our internet alone. Yep. So if you're watching this right now, go to that website and complain. If we can get enough people complaining, maybe they'll listen and. Yep. Anyway, uh, moving on. Yep. Moving on to uh, GeForce Experience. This should be a quick one. Uh, they basically they've added in support now on the GeForce Experience for OpenGL and Vulkan. So. I guess if you were planning to do some streaming or recording with Shadowplay for Doom and Minecraft, then you're you're going to be all set now. Although I feel like I have recorded Doom in the past on Shadowplay without any issues. Oh, you know what it was? I got it to work, but I had to set it to record desktop. So you could record these games in the past by setting it to record desktop mode, um, but I guess now it's officially supported as recognizing them as games. So that's cool. Well, it's also nice, and I hope what that means is that NVIDIA recognizes that, that OpenGL and Vulkan are worth more attention, because if AMD is the only company supporting Vulkan, the, the reason I sent you this link is because it, if, if only one of the two GPU companies is supporting Vulkan, and, and that company only sells 25% of the graphics cards, then Vulkan's never going anywhere. Um, if, we, if we ever want to get off of our dependence on Microsoft and DirectX, then then we need the graphics card companies to support alternative APIs, and we need game companies to support them if we ever want to run anything but Windows. No, yeah, I, I agree with that for sure. We need to see more support for OpenGL and Vulkan stuff if we want to see more of it, and Vulkan is something I do want to see more of. I just, and that leads uh, right into the next topic, by the way. Speaking of not being locked into anything. Yeah, yeah the Windows uh, 10S is kind of taking the whole walled garden approach and just really turning it up to 10, to Windows who 10. <laughs> who didn't see this coming when Windows 10 came out with all of its telemetry and restrictions? Yeah, so Windows 10S is going to be, their marketing this is going towards like classroom. So basically everything will be limited. It'll have a set list of Windows approved programs that'll work on these PCs and that's it. You won't be able to download or add new apps unless they introduce it as an update to the OS as a whole, is, is basically is my understanding of it. You can only get apps from the App Store. My, yeah. In other words, Microsoft wants, wants a cut of all the app sales. They want to... They're trying to close Windows 10 like the way iOS and Android – well, Android's more open, but iOS, you know, all the apps have to go to the App Store. Well, I just hope that this never becomes the standard version of Windows for people because if they decide that that's the way it has to go and then, like, for, then all of your Steam games have to run through the Microsoft Store, then screw that. Oh, but, but hang on. Here's the best part. These new Surface laptops that come with Windows 10 S – and the, and the convertibles that come with Windows 10 S. The Windows 10 S is the home version of Windows. If you pay to upgrade to Windows 10 Pro, that restriction comes off. So the w version of Windows 10 that comes on these devices will, it's, in other words, it's a completely artificial limitation put in there to simply say, but if you give Microsoft more money, they'll lift the restriction for that one device. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I just I don't know when we'll actually see this on you know like normal around normal consumer PCs. So, so I'm not really sure that if I got anything else to add on to this one. I hope we don't. I, that 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 defeats what the PC is in the first place. If I wanted to be in a walled garden, I wouldn't be on a computer. I mean, that shoot, that's a console. You know, it, the whole point of a computer is you can do what you want with your computer. You can download. I mean. Is it going to be even possible, for example, to download CPU-Z and GPU-Z on Windows 10S? Yeah, it might not be able to. I mean, if even those won't run, what use is it? Or, it's about, a, it's or, a, or older programs that just don't get updated anymore. Like, I just had upgraded to the Creator update on one of my systems about a week ago, and it broke, like, every program that I use for benchmarking. It broke... Merlis Action, it broke Fraps, it broke Amasai Afterburner. I couldn't even launch Sony Vegas. And so I ended up having to revert the whole OS back. But it, it was just, it was awful. The, the, 
whoever's running Microsoft today has completely missed why Windows became the dominant OS on 95% of the personal computers on Earth. It's because backwards compatibility, you can run 15 to 20 year old programs. You can run many, well, with 64 bit Windows, a lot of that got broken, but it was the universal compatibility and the fact that everything worked and the fact that you could do what you want with your computer. And now that they keep locking it down with, with the fact that you can't turn off Windows updates, you can't control you know, Cortana, you can't control, oh, and Windows 10 S, you can't, um, Bing is the only search engine you can use. You cannot switch to Chrome. To, I mean, you can't switch to Google for your search engine. That sucks. So basically you're locked into Bing because everyone likes Bing. You're... <laughs> like, do you want to download the Bing bar? I was like, that, is that even an option this time? Or is, am I being forced to download the Bing bar? Everyone, Bing bar is for everyone. I remember when that used to get bundled in with every install. I'm not touching Windows 10S with a 10-foot pole. A 10S foot pole. <laughs> I, won't, I, it, I won't tell you what the S stands for in my book. <laughs> Shit. Now, now. <laughs> All right, so last topic of the day is that Fractal Design finally has a new AIO coming to the market. They put out the trailer today. They're going to have a 240-millimeter version and a 360-millimeter version. It is built off of an Asetek design. So I've, I've been waiting for this for a while because they had previously had an all-in-one cooler that they got into issues with for the patenting, and they had to stop selling it here in the United States because of... You know, they basically had their own pump and everything like that, but it was infringing on the copyright or the patent of Asetek, who they ended up partnering with anyway for the design of this cooler, which kind of brings it full circle. So, sort of, uh, if you can't beat them, join them type of thing. But, uh, yeah, it's looking pretty good. It'll be an Asetek design, but, you know, they put in, like, a PWM fan hub onto the radiator, which is nice to see. And uh, I just really like it mostly just for the all-black design without any LEDs or anything like that. So I think it'll be easy to work into most builds without having to worry about the looks too much. So that's kind of why I like it. Have we seen pricing on this yet? Um, I have. They There was reviews that went up, so I'm sure they have prices in their reviews. I just don't know them off the top of my head. Um, one thing that I would definitely like to see is, is some lower cost options because Corsair's liquid coolers, of which I've used many, have been creeping up in price. In fact, I think their 280 millimeter cooler is up in the $120, $130 range at the moment. It's a great cooler, but Lord, I mean, for that much money, um, I don't know. I, in fact, I actually just tweeted about a deal. I, is it? Was that today? I think that is today, actually. For anybody who's interested... I know it's not about this, but uh, was that deal today? Yes, no, hang on. Yes. Um, man, I hate to step all over Fractal, but um, Newegg has a deal of the day, good today only, mm -hmm. for a 240 millimeter liquid cooler for 60 bucks. Yeah, I saw that for the Deep Cool Captain, which is a pretty good cooler. I've had no issues with that. Oh, do you have one? I've got quite a few, yeah. Um, so would you recommend that for, for, for 60 bucks? Absolutely. They usually, usually you can find them for 90. It's usually seems to what they sell for nowadays. So for 60 bucks, yeah, definitely recommend it. Okay. I, I haven't because... had, I haven't had one leak yet, which is usually a good selling point for me on any liquid cooler. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's relatively quiet also. And they look cool. I think that's probably like their biggest selling point against any other cooler is just that it looks kind of cool has like that reactor pump so yeah it looks it's uh, attractive and they have multiple colors available usually as well so cool kind of helps with the personalization of the system if you're trying to match things up well all one thing that i've been meaning to do is to do a a, a i have recommended liquid coolers for overclocking and top end systems for a long time one of the questions that's come up lately, and I've been thinking about this in regards to Ryzen, because Ryzen is not as good of an overclocker as, as some of Intel's chips are. And the, a good example of this is, for example, Ryzen 7 1700 
on the Wraithspire LED cooler generally will run just fine for most people at a fixed 3.7 gigahertz. A few people might get 3.8, but 3.7 is probably the number to aim for. 4.0 is should be totally doable on a 240 millimeter liquid cooler. The question is, is 4.0 versus 3.7 actually worth spending a hundred dollars? Or in the case of Corsair, $120. Are you getting performance that justifies that price, or should you take that $100 or $120 and throw it into your graphics card or into an SSD or into more system RAM? Yeah, I guess it, I think it depends. It comes down to what what's important to you as far as the budget is concerned. I mean, I I like water coolers for more reasons for me anyway than just you know better temperatures. I mean, better temps is nice. I also find the overall systems to be quieter that are using water coolers because the other fans in the system don't have to work as hard. Uh, and then also changing out graphics cards. As someone that's changing out GPUs regularly, it is a pain in the ass doing it with a massive heat sink in the way. I, like, I've, I've been doing it in my X99 system now for a few months, just dealing with it. And then I was working on a system with a water cooler, and I was like, oh, my God, it's just so much easier to work in without a big heat sink in the way. So, What, being, what air cooler did you have on your X99? Uh, Be Quiet, Dark Rock 3. Did you like that? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good cooler, like super quiet. It cools more than enough. I was still able to get the same overclock on that cooler that I had on my Predator cooler before, although admittedly running at about 20 to 25 degrees hotter. But, yeah, it, it does the job. I mean, it's not. I don't feel like it would ever limit someone in any way, you know, compared to a water cooler. But water coolers have their benefits, and I'm, I'm for one, one of the people that would be willing to pay for it for the benefits that they have. Fair enough. Yeah, but... It's obviously going to change on person to person basis. If you just or if you're just concerned with getting your system up and running, then there's nothing wrong with an air cooler. Well, I just after looking at the at the Wraith Spire coolers that come with the Ryzen chips versus the oh, those stock are Intel coolers. Those I'm sorry. Are, those things are perfect. They're they're nice. They're a nice middle ground. I mean, it's it's not a. It's not a Hyper Two Twelve Evo. It's not a Dark Rock Pro Three. It's mm -hmm. it's it's um. But it, it's much nicer than the Intel stock coolers, for example. Yeah, and on the, the lower TDP in, uh, Ryzen parts, like the 1600 and the 1400 and 1700, with the 65-watt TDP, I've found those coolers to be just absolutely perfect. I didn't feel like I needed anything more. Or I didn't feel temperature limited on anything. Like on the Ryzen 1400 with that overclocked on Ida 64 for an hour, it topped out at 64 degrees Celsius. With a, with the Wraith Max cooler, you're not yeah uh, you're not temp limited then. I mean you're you might be voltage limited, you might be just chip design limited. Um, I've got a 240 millimeter uh, uh, master liquid uh, cooler master um, liquid cooler on my Ryzen 7 1700, and. I can't get that to run at 4.0, but it's not a temperature limitation. It's just it's just that chip won't run at 4.0. Yeah. And um, I think it's completely wasted to put that cooler on a 1700 if it's not going to run at 4.0 with a $100 liquid cooler. It's just crazy. Yeah, and as Noble said in the chat, knock to air coolers for the win. I would have to agree. I had finally used one, the one that came with the Ryzen CPUs. And, like, that was just a really nice little cooler, like a single fan. But, like, the fan felt, like, solid, man. That thing was, like, it felt like it was made to be on that heat sink just, and never come off because it was just, mm, just perfect seal on it. Just, it's, it's something hard to explain to people, but it was just, it just felt really good. Noctua Those stuff coolers, is always well made. Well, the, the, the D15, the really big one, I've, I've had people tell me over and over and over that their monster cooler cools just as well as the 240 millimeter liquid coolers. Mm -hmm. My only concern is if, have you seen how big that thing is? I have, yeah, it's ridiculous. I remember watching a video that Linus did where they tried to install it and it actually blocked two of their RAM slots. Mm -hmm. they, they managed to find some low profile DDR4 RAM they could install, but the problem is, is once you installed it and put the cooler in place, you couldn't take the RAM out without taking the cooler off. Yep. I have no doubt that it's a great cooler, but that just strikes me as, you know, you were saying being able to work in your system with a liquid cooler because it frees up all that space. Mm -hmm. That's 
what you're missing with one of those huge tower coolers, I think. And I think you see, you don't get as much of a return on that, you know, for what you're giving up there in terms of space, in term, with the temperatures that you get as a result of it, because I would rather just go with a the standard, you know, tower heatsink from Noctua that just has the single fan, whatever that one is, was that came with the Ryzen review kits, because that thing was perfect. I had no issues with that cooler. It was quiet, solidly built. I didn't actually get one of those. Oh, no? Uh, they sent me the... Um... Um, they sent me a 240 millimeter liquid cooler with my oh, wow. review kit, Lucky the uh, the EK water block. Wow, nice. It was, except the first one they sent me um, didn't died. work. <laughs> my yeah, my EK Predator pump died after just under a year. So, I think credit, I think credit, we, I think we understand why those are getting phased out now. Credit to AMD, they fedexed me 1 a.m. the early the next day i mean they were all over it so thank you but uh yeah it 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 worked for maybe um 30 minutes that sucks didn't leak though i mean yeah something to be said for that i guess yeah <laughs> it didn't leak it no it didn't leak it just stopped working it just it just did, it didn't pump water but it also didn't leak probably because it wasn't pumping water and the temps went up real fast. Yep, that's what happened with mine also. Just like, I was like, what's going on here? Why is, am I getting 99 degrees Celsius? Uh, all right, well, I think we're going to go ahead and probably get on out of here, coming to the end of the show. We're all out of topics. But uh, we'll be back next week, same time, same place. And uh, hopefully Tech Deals will be here as well. And uh, we'll see you guys next Thank week, all right? Thank you for having me, Joker. Thanks for coming, everybody. Yeah, no problem. If you guys haven't checked out Tech Deals channel yet, Please do so. I put it at the top of the uh, description there for anyone that wants to go check them out. And we'll uh, see you guys next week. Ciao.